Good afternoon, everybody. It has been a very interesting session, uh, which is we are going to look forward to uh, with this next one hour or so. Uh, from the time we started, 8.30 in the morning, we heard a lot of uh, comments about the tagline, what you're talking about, the digital lifestyle. And the key word is, we're talking about a lifeline, how we overcome the current challenges what we are faced. This is exactly talking about the turmoil what we are in. And we heard from the central bank governor, from the industry, even the IFC uh, panelists who spoke about what technology is all about and the investments what they have looked at. So within next one hour or so, we'll make use of the time to uh, take some questions with the leaderships of the Sri Lankan telecom companies, what they think about, how they act as a catalyst to overcome these challenges, looking at the uh, what we are faced right now. And also, as uh, the MC mentioned, there's a WhatsApp number. You can uh, send your questions, and I will take it up from the panelists as well. So one, one bottom line, what we can think of from listening uh, from the morning, even if you analyze the uh, the budget speech, his excellency the president presented as a finance minister lately. It's, it's one core thing what they're talking about. The way we work, we live, we study, everything is getting changed and digitally is becoming in between. So midday, which is we are having this session together with the telco CEOs, obviously they are the key people who bring the, the main middle layer, that is the connectivity across, which is the services and the users which is they bring the downstream across the country so with that note i will first move to thiru uh, starting the first question uh, so obviously being in a challenge situation we need to really look at new things and you have been talking about this paradigm shift across and also your organization which is went through a merger in a recent uh, time with that the question to you is how we are looking at with the merger and also the paradigms you are looking at. What is your game plan and what is your thought process on that? Thank you very much. Um, I think as we all acknowledge, uh, you know, this uh, industry is going through a, another major paradigm shift as we move from a voice-centric uh, network and services environment to a broadband data-centric uh, service environment. And I think this has been moving over the last uh, five, six, seven years. And uh, increasingly, the adoption of broadband has been increasing rapidly in this country. Now, as we move towards, in this paradigm shift, we move towards this uh, kind of more broadband data-centric uh, environment, uh, networks have to also evolve uh, and move in that direction. And I think this is one of the reasons why um, a couple, two years, three years ago, um, Hutch has proceeded to merge with Edisala Lanka uh, in Sri Lanka where we merged both networks of Edis Sri Lanka and Hutch Network together. And there were, two re the, there were two strategic reasons for this. One was that by merging, we were able to assemble the required broadband spectrum that is needed for a future broadband environment. So we then had sufficient broadband data spectrum available to grow our broadband business. Uh, the second reason was that by acquiring, uh, merging with Edis Salad, we also acquired their towers, and we were able to combine their towers with our towers. And whilst we were doing the merger, we were able to immediately deploy a nationwide 4G network that today covers 95% of the population. So we were able to quickly deploy a broadband connectivity very quickly with this merger. So I think these are the reasons why we proceeded with the merger, and um, so far we're well positioned to address uh, the future broadband needs of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Thiri, for that insight. So I will move to Supun as the, the, the second question. So one of, the, one of the things, like, you know, talking about the digital lifeline, so digital economy plays a key role in this. And uh, we, we heard the numbers also, which is as a, as a nation, we had about 4.5% on the digital economy. Altogether, which is the mature markets, we are looking at about 30%, and the global average is about 15%. So when you're looking at it, we are actually in the very low stage. So the question to you, Supuni, is like, you know, uh, looking at all that as a leading player in the digital space, as an organization, uh, what your take on it, and like, you know, what is the contribution, or how you are, how you are addressing this, and what is your contribution from a dialogue point of view looking at? Thank you, Indika. Uh, good afternoon, and firstly, Thank you for having me here. 
it's indeed a great uh, honor and a privilege to share our thoughts uh, at this very important day uh, in the industry. Um, I think before I talk about digital economy, this is, this is one challenge that uh, we are, as I co-chair with Sanjeeva Veeravarana uh, at the Ceylon Chamber on digital economy, we have a subcommittee uh, which is driving digital economy. So let, we said, let's start measuring the size of our digital economy and let's start uh, improving the impact that we create. Still, we haven't really got a uh, complete uh, hang of how to do that reliable measurement, uh, just like we measure the GDP. Uh, having said that, uh, overall, telcos has done a massive impact in the country over the last 25 years in terms of making connectivity available, affordable, accessible to everyone in the country. Um, COVID was a good example. Fuel crisis was another example how we were able to keep the country go going despite mobility challenges. However, this doesn't happen overnight, um, and this doesn't happen by one provider alone. Um, it's the entire industry that comes together with all the other stakeholders to make that happen. The regulator plays a very, very important role in terms of making sure the spectrum resources, all the other access is made available on time. Then the investors play a very massive role in terms of driving infrastructure availability. Our industry is hugely dependent on foreign exchange. Um, if not for foreign exchange, we cannot expand. At Dialog, we invest about 150 million to 200 million dollars every year. And that dollars needs to come from the local economy and we don't have access to dollars otherwise. So when the economy dries up of dollars, then we have likes of IFC coming in and helping to keep going uh, with our expansions and making the basic connectivity available. Uh, because the basic connectivity layer is very important to do anything beyond. Without basic connectivity, you cannot talk about applications. And once you have the basic infrastructure layer, it's about building applications on top. And even looking at this team, if we are to come out of this challenge, yes, we have to bring debt sustainability. We have to increase government revenues. But what we need to recognize is technology provides a much efficient, cheaper solution to cutting through some of the big problems that we have. Corruption, transparency, inefficiency. All can be eliminated if we embrace technology. National Fuel Pass was one such example. It was simple technology, how the entire country was changed. But I think as a nation, while we have all the technology, we don't embrace that and we don't really take that technology to solve problems. We are increasing taxes to support, especially the benefit trans and taking care of the poor. But can we look at a digital solution which will eliminate waste and corruption in that entire process? At least in India, they have adopted a solution on a keyword where they have cut down the amount of money they have spent on benefit transfers, which they have spent about 90 billion, saved 22 billion dollars by digitizing that process. So at least dialogue is ready to help the country taking these solutions and bringing technology to solve some of these critical challenges so that entire burden doesn't need to come on few uh, people in the country. So that's one. And the other part is around how do you bring connectivity with applications to help critical sectors like healthcare and education. In terms of education, we, through our Nanasa TV platform, where we have about eight channels dedicated free of charge for education, for everyone in the country to access with the partnership of Ministry of Education is a great platform because children at home and as well as at school can get access to content. And another great initiative that Dialog as well as all telcos did during COVID 
was to give free of charge access to all universities, all public universities in the country to access internet through their learn platform and to all school children to access the um, e Taksalava platform of Ministry of Education free of charge again. We started in March 2020 and to date we keep that free of charge. I think public talks about the amount of money we take but we don't really talk about the impact that we create by giving access to education or access to healthcare or access to financial services. Lastly, I think it's about how can we bring technology as a key driver, access to internet as a key driver to fast track economic growth because if we are to get back to the previous stage of the economy, then we need to bring technology and broadband led connectivity improvements, use of technology to accelerate that journey. So with that, I'll end and then we'll take questions later. Thank you, Sopo. Thanks for that insight. As you mentioned, the QR code, like you know, which is commonly known as made a huge difference. And that's an example like you know, across the nation, everybody experience and how wide listing of the the connectivity going into the, uh, uh, the kids and how they make use of the uh, technology for their teaching learning purpose during the COVID time. With that similar line, I will move to Janaka. Uh, so question for Janaka for you is that as a government owned entity as Sri Lanka Telecom and Mobitel, uh, uh, one of the points is we discuss is the, the, the digitization of the government or the state, even central governor, uh, central bank governor spoke about how the digital services has to go. Even the recent uh, budget which talk about by 2024, all the government services has to be online, the payments, which is obviously the points Supun made about corruption and transparency, etc. will come in. So as SLT Mobitel, as a government-owned entity, what's your take on it and what's the role you play uh, in, uh, from your point of view and under your leadership? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. So good afternoon. Uh, so uh, before I take your question, I think about the internet, because this is the Sri Lanka Internet Day. So we, I think, started somewhere in mid-1990s, and we used to have these dial-up connections. Right, and it was very slow, not reliable and all. But now over these maybe the 25, 30 years, I think there's a lot of improvement in the country when it comes to internet and also for the connectivity. Uh, when I say connectivity, it's the wireless and wired both. So uh, to answer your specific question about the government digitalization, I think uh, government was trying to adopt these digital technologies from a long time back, I mean, the school net project came in somewhere in uh, 2003 4 that time and they connected uh, 1400 schools if i remember correct so all these uh, schools were connected uh, through copper a fixed medium and dialogue also was a part of it i think some schools were connected through wireless medium and uh, that project i think after about 10 years or so uh, it just uh, uh, couldn't, I mean, sustain, I think. And now individual schools are getting connections uh, through all these uh, telcos, not only SLT. And uh, then I think the main project the government came up with was the Lanka Government Network. So the initial project was LGN1, where they connected about 500 uh, odd uh, government officers. And there again, SLT played a pivotal role where we connected these offices through uh, copper uh, connectivity, fixed line connectivity. Uh, but the bandwidth was about, if I remember correct, it's uh, 512 k. It's very small speeds. But at that time, it was a very good speed. But when you look at the present day applications, I think it's not enough. So we moved to LGN2, uh, where we have connected uh, 860 government offices. And that is through optical fiber. So it's a countrywide network connecting 860 offices through optical fiber. And uh, we have Wi-Fi available at the government offices. And uh, getting a huge internet, fixed internet uh, bandwidth uh, pumping into this network. And uh, Dialog is hosting the Lanka Government Cloud. And we have a connection to Lanka Government Cloud where uh, most of these applications are cloud-based. 
so you can see like when you talk about connectivity, it's not only the internet and the uh, connectivity per se, but uh, even you need the storage and to run these applications, you need uh, cloud uh, platforms also. So when you think about uh, the entire ecosystem, I think the, to, to deliver these services to the uh, citizens of Sri Lanka, uh, you need the internet connectivity. Uh, I think it has to be a reliable and a secure connectivity and that all these telcos are uh, trying hard to provide to cover the entire island and to give like a minimum like average speed uh, to these consumers or the citizen. And also investing heavily on these uh, data center and cloud platforms and also uh, the international cable networks. Uh, so just to give you one example, like say for banking application, now all these ATMs are converting into kiosk, right? Then they are uh, not only the financial, like I mean, when you walk in, uh, there can be a camera where you are, uh, it's, it takes your image and it tries to authenticate you. So in that sense, uh, some of this traffic will go through the internet, but some of the mission critical traffic, like where you need to get the actual financial transaction, like the deposit or the withdrawal, uh, that part, it will go to the core banking system through a, a fixed line or a, a physical, uh, like a MPLS kind of a connection or SD WAN connection. So when you look at all these, I think uh, Sri Lanka's digitalization, we uh, like health sector, if you take education sector, then transportation, so everywhere bits and pieces are there, but there should be some authority, I think ICT is there, and uh, who will drive this initiative to have a digitalization for the entire country uh, to give equal access to everybody, right, and to empower citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Janaka, and explaining the initiatives that have been driven and how the government or the state uh, digitalization is happening, and definitely that's a much needed area need to be improved. Uh, next, I will move to Ashish. Uh, uh, change in the direction a bit uh, as Airtel, as a uh, regional and a global telco. Uh, want to uh, ask you, Ashish, is that uh, you heard about the Sri Lankan context, and we seated here and listening to the previous panels as well. Uh, looking at that, the experience what uh, Airtel can bring it to the country, uh, which is from the regional and the global, what you've learned, and also very lately. Uh, in India, the uh, 5G has been launched uh, by Airtel itself. Uh, so you must be having a lot of learnings uh, from that uh, experience. So want to pick your brain on that, uh, what you can bring it uh, uh, from a global perspective as well as your experience in the new technologies and the transformation. Sure, thank you very much, Chintika, for a uh, fantastic question. And uh, thank you very much, Fritzi, for calling us uh, here to share our views. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, Airtel is a global organization. Uh, we have presence now in about 18 countries, serving nearly 450 million customers, which makes us the second largest telecom company in the world. And we are operating in different part of the world in different continents. And when we pick up the learnings from this and see what is that can be implemented in Sri Lanka, there are a lot of things. Uh, first thing that I talk about is we have seen a very clear correlation between the economic growth of a country to the penetration of broadband services in the country. And when we do an empirical calculation, it comes out to be that every 10% increase in the penetration of broadband service leads to 1% growth of GDP. So there's a, there's a direct correlation. And when we look at what are the factors which leads to increase in the broadband penetration and ultimately to the economic growth, we find five common factors across the world. First is the cost of the device, which means the cost of the smartphones. As the cost reduces, the penetration increases, more and more people use it. Second is the availability or penetration of broadband services across the country, which is like, is the service available to everybody? Third is the cost of the broadband services itself. Is it affordable to the common masses, and can they use it freely for everything that they use? Fourth is the digital mindset both from the government aspect and the private sector. Are they doing things which is digital first, or they are still migrating the old legacy system into digital systems? And last but not the least is the level playing field, so a very robust regulatory framework so that the new operators and the small operators have an equal chance to grow uh, as the large operators are. 
And I think in, in Sri Lanka, we have made progress in some of them, but there's still a little way to go forward. Talking about the 5G, which I think is the buzzword, and I've been hearing since the time that I've landed up here, at least four or five questions being asked about 5G. So in India, uh, we had been working on 5G from last one year. Uh, we have recently launched the commercial services on 5G a uh, few months back. As we speak, we nearly had about 5,000 to 6,000 towers being installed, covering probably all the large uh, cities in the country. Our plan is to expand 5G to all across the country by end of uh, or middle of next year. Frankly speaking, we have invested nearly tens of billion dollars in rolling out the 5G services. And the kind of service that we are offering as of now is a very high grade service based on NSA network, which means uh, consumers are typically getting a speeds of 600 Mbps to about 800 Mbps in the live network. But the first few experiences that we are getting is, frankly speaking, not very encouraging. Okay. Because when we go to the consumer, so there are multiple challenges which has been faced. First, the penetration of the 5G devices is still at about 7 to 8%. And it's not very different even in Sri Lanka if you talk about 5 to 7%. So all the tens of billions of investment which has happened is as of now catering to about this 7 to 8% consumers. And the consumers are getting a fantastic speeds of 600 Mbps, but when you actually go to the consumer and ask them, what is the difference you're feeling, there's hardly any difference. And the reason for that is because there is nothing which resides on your mobile today which cannot be catered through a 4G network. There's not a single application on the consumer side or a use case on the consumer side which requires a 5G network in today's time. Okay. Even if we talk about the industrial applications. So we had been serving the industrial application through private networks. Uh, typical private networks are either the low latency fixed service private networks, which are best catered by a fiber network. You don't need even a 4G for catering to that because the ultimate user is a fixed device. Even if we talk about the low latency mobile applications, which is typically the robotics being used in the industries, they're also the 4G is good enough to cater to. The, probably the only requirement of 5G will come when we have an ultra low latency mobile applications or use case which will come, which is typically in a high, high security areas. Now, frankly speaking, when we look around, we are yet to discover an economically viable use case for that network to be implemented as of now in India. While we are going ahead with our rollouts in India, hoping and working with the application providers to develop those applications, but there's no recent application of actual 5G in the country which is, which is happening there. Now, if I convert this into a context to Sri Lanka, even if we have to roll out 5G in the areas which are critical areas of the large cities, my guesstimate is that each operator will require nearly about 200 250 million dollars to roll out the network across the Sri Lanka which means the four networks into, four, into, into this amount, nearly about a billion dollar investment, Sri Lanka needs to roll out the 5G network. With only five to 7% penetration of devices now, and probably even the best forecast is about 15 to 20% penetration of 5G devices in the next one and a half years time. Where will this money come from is a big question mark and a current state of economy where we are. And where will the return on this investment will come from? Even if we are, as an industry, able to procure this $1, million, $1 billion and able to invest, the return, ideally, the, the burden of return will ultimately be passed on to the consumers. So is this the right time for us to make an investment and increase the burden on the consumer by raising their prices is a big question mark that Sri Lanka will, will have as, as of now. Other thing that we need to look at on the 5G, and this is again our experience of launching 5G in India and preparing for 5G in other, other countries in the world, we need a lot of clarity even on the regulatory framework. Things like which kind of a spectrum will be utilized? What is the kind of amount of spectrum which will be available and at what cost? Because that will decide the network strategy for each operator to roll out 5G in a long-term basis. In 5G, you need a lot of microsites, which means the usage of the public furniture, which I mean is uh, the lamp poles, the bus shelters, garment, infrastructure which is available has to be made available to the industry so that they can start putting up those micro sites in every 100 meters or 200 meters. 
Now, there has to be a policy which has to be framed on making the public and furniture available to the telecom operators. Another big thing which is required for launching a 5G is an access of a fiber network to the last mile, because 5G sites typically works only on the fiber network. We do not have, as of now, a clear guideline saying how the fiber infrastructure in the country will be shared with all the operators, because as of now we speak, it's, it's only with about one large operator who owns the entire fiber and has to be shared with all the other operators. So I think we are still a little way away from having a clarity on the 5G in terms of the regulatory uh, framework. And before we launch 5G or we even prepare for 5G, we need answers for these, uh, these questions that I raised to be, to be done. So frankly speaking, if you really ask me, I think based on my experience, we are a little still away from a 5G to be launched in Sri Lanka, and rightly so, more so in the current economic condition. Other thing which also we picked up from the learning from other uh, countries where we are operating, I think uh, we also need to work a little bit on providing a level playing field in, in Sri Lanka. So I represent an organization which is not the market leader. We are still new kids on the block, about a decade old in the, in the country and uh, not the biggest. I think we also need to work as an industry to provide a level playing field. Things like we need to quickly launch MNP services, which the industry is working on, but that is something which is very much required for us to provide uh, excellent customer services and customer experience to our people. Similarly, abolition of things like interconnect charges, uh, because interconnect charges is something which is not pro new, ent new entrants and uh, it doesn't give a level playing field to new entrants. So I think there's still a work to be done on providing a level playing field to our small operators or the new operators in, in, in the country. So that's another area I think we need to work on to provide that. And I am very positive that the regulator and the government is working towards that. So that's some of the learnings that I picked up. Thank you. Thank you for that very insight and sharing the experiences of the India and the 5G experiences that you have done. Um, so I will move into Dr. Prasad. Uh, as, uh, so Dr. Prasad, uh, in my opinion, I'll, I have the privilege of putting him in the spot. as uh, He's the chair for the uh, FITIs as well. And also probably, uh, Dr. Prasad, here you look at in a way uh, answering the question as the CEO of Lankabil, as well as the chair for the FITIs as the apex body. Uh, so uh, uh, Ashish ended up, uh, like you know, one of the statement he made was, okay, we are looking at a 5G redeployment, all telcos put together, we need about billion dollars. And the penetration of the devices is a challenge, right? Do, do we need to really do that or put the burden back to the society? Or is there, I mean, there's a question mark on it. When we do, how do you do? And one of the programs even was uh, done by the, the, the government, uh, like probably very recently was uh, taking the connectivity, uh, rural lease, the government suddenly made the name. So looking at these equations, looking at government Sanwede, I believe there's a certain amount of subsidy came in, but again, the telcos also invested in it. Uh, looking at that equation, from an industry point of view as a telco uh, leader as well, what is your view on it? What would have been done better? Or uh, what is the way forward? What do you think? Thank you, Indika. Thank you for the fitness, even though I am here in the both sides. Thank you for the audience for coming and joining today. And the uh, good questions uh, Indika put me in. And I'm sure the telco, as a team, we work really together. We try to solve the country problems. When we work together, we are not thinking actually individuals. In that sense, I really don't want to talk about Lanka Bell here. Certainly, if there's a q and I will be able to answer. The question about the Gamata Sandi Vedane is a really a nice project, superb one. But if you take the today's snapshot and look back, I think the way we started wrong. We should have done, a, instead of a blanket coverage, we should have done the correct coverage areas. I still recall the first meeting, and it's in the website as well. Even the Thiru mentioned the same thing. Why not to cover the main populated area first, and then go to the next layer? I'm sure everybody can recall it. Gamata Sanivedan is a project we started with all the villagers and to create a complete blanket coverage for broadband connectivity or the shared connectivity. It's not for dedicated. So if you have a, if you are a part of the bank, if you want the ATM, you want the connectivity, yes, any telco can provide it. We are talking about the mobile connectivity, fixed connectivity for a blanket level. Then what we did it, we went to the village, we understand the village requirement, 
we started with the, all these stakeholders. Because of that, the resistance was very, very low. But the project was very good. And the funding came some percentage from the, the fund, which we collected, Rural Development Fund, which we, or the TRC collected and supposed to give it back. But in that sense, too, we started the Ratnapura. I'm sure everybody can recall Ratnapura as a first district, the district level to go, first district to have a blanket coverage. Then we moved to Kurunagala, and then we moved one, two, but unfortunately half stop. And the way the Indica mentioned is from the industry point of view, I think what we want is may not be to the uh, everywhere, maybe to the real required areas first to cover, and then we would have gone to at least maybe by two times like today. But uh, still the project is good. Uh, still if we can restart and finish it is a superb idea. But all these things impacted the outside economic problems as well. It's not the, only the, the project owner's problem or the initial thinking issue, but at that time environment was different. The later the environment was, is a complete different setup. The today's level, I'm sure everybody will agree if we can go back, we should have covered the more human area first, then we would have had a good chance to complete maybe 70, 80, 90 percent, and then we would have gone to the next layer. Even though the delay in the next layer will not have the same impact like today. Thank you, Thank you Prasad, uh, for that uh, elaboration. So I have got quite a bit of questions on that also. So on the time, we are halfway. So I will go around with another another round of questions uh, directly. Somehow, actually, blended in the questions what I'm asking as well. Uh, so again, I'll move to uh, Thiru for the second round. Uh, so we we uh, I mean, Pasa talk about the government sanitation going downstream, and uh, also Janaka spoke about it, the government services, etc. Now, one of the key aspect is like you know, yes, we can give the services, we can go downstream, but one of the critical factors is experience. Uh, so, in your opinion, how important is that experience as well as the readiness of the network and how do you think we need to manage it better? Thank you very much. Um, I, I think this is something that, um, you know, it, it's something that, that has not, I feel, not been fully uh, thought, thought out uh, as we enter the uh, broadband, uh, broadband arena. And here I'm not just talking about uh, Sri Lanka, but I, I feel as an industry and globally, the thing is this, you know, bro broadband, as is defined, basically you're giving one big broadband pipe to be shared, to be shared by a number of customers or subscribers. Um, it's not like in the old days where, you, you know, like a telephone, telephone call, you have the circuit to yourself. But here you're sharing a broadband pipe with a number of other customers. And when you start sharing a, a pipe with a number of other people, all kinds of complications can arise. If one user excessively uses that pipe, it deters or degrades the service quality of other users. So I think this is one area I think that has not been fully, you know, fully un uh, understood and addressed to ensure that everybody joining a broadband service connectivity is given a good quality of experience. Sometimes I, uh, to explain this to some of my staff, I compare this to um, the uh, e E1 Expressway, E1 Expressway to Matra. That is a, that is a highway, that is a, that is a real highway. We're talking about a digital highway. But you can imagine an E1 Expressway going to Matra where there is no lanes, no speed limits, anyone can come on that road and use it. What do you think is gonna happen to that road? What, what do you think is gonna happen to that experience of people driving to Matra? So there's a reason why you have these controls and guidelines in place to make sure everybody has a good experience driving to Matra. And it's not blocked or obstructed or slowed down by other people. So this is where, you know, I, I, this might be some, something a bit radical. Broadband needs, needs these kind of controls in order for us to continue to deliver a good experience to all the subscribers using this. So there has to be some controls. And Hutch, as a, as a company, we have been following and managing these controls unilaterally over the last few years 
uh, on our network um, through FUP, FUQ controls to make the objective is to make sure everybody gets a fair share of the broadband pipe. And even now recently, uh, we're just trialing and just launching another kind of control device, which is child-friendly internet, where we will control how a child access internet, make sure that he gets uh, access to the right, right websites, and also we can control his usage, and also how much time he spends on the internet. I'm sure a lot of you as parents will understand with children the difficulties we have today controlling our children use of internet on their, on their smartphones. So this is another, another example where, you know, for, to, in order for us to continue to deliver a good broadband experience, we have to manage this broadband pipe. In the past, the solution was simple. When you got the first broadband pipe that was full, for example, your 3G pipe got full, what was the solution? The solution was go and install a 4G pipe. It's like saying today, Gall Road is full. What's the solution? Go and build Marine Drive. That is not going to solve the problem. And now when your 4G pipe is full, what are you going to do? Go and build a 5G pipe? So this is not the way for us to ensure a, a, a good experience, a good broadband experience to people, to all our customers, all our subscribers in Sri Lanka. So I think it's very important as an industry, not just the telecom industry, but also as an ICT industry, we must understand this and work together to make sure that we really focus not just on speed, for the sake of speed. As Ashish mentioned, they deployed 5G in India, they're getting, you know, 600, 700, 800 Mbps. But what does that mean? To most Indian subscribers, it meant nothing. So it's just, it's just, so the discussion is more than just about speed. It's how do you manage that experience to make sure everybody on that digital highway gets the same quality of experience. And we have to put in place controls and mechanisms to ensure that. Otherwise, we're all going to end up in one big traffic jam very soon. So I think this is where we need to think, think a bit more carefully and um, develop the right solutions to enable us to, to manage our broadband network of the future. Thank you. Thanks, Tiro. Thanks. Uh, for the next question, I'll move into Supun. Uh, so uh, taking the lead from what uh, Tiro said is about the importance of having that system of managing it and uh, make sure the experience is going downstream as well as one of the uh, points again uh, reiterating like you know, if you're looking at the 5G about the $1 billion or so which is we need to invest. Uh, Supun, the question to you is uh, uh, we spoke about all the good things but definitely you're faced with challenges. Uh, well, one thing is maintenance and growing and also the network expansion. Obviously, the customer demand is getting increased, especially people are working from home, etc. coming in. What are the challenges uh, faced uh, by all on, on this overall picture uh, is the question for you. Um, yeah, so I think challenges are many, but um, we see opportunities on, in all these challenges. Uh, so more the challenges, the more the opportunities. That's how we see things. Uh, and I think if you roll back Dialogue Story 25 years, uh, the success of Dialogue Story is how we navigate through and make the most of every challenge that we were faced with. Um, coming forth into this country um, and then getting to leadership um, and expanding beyond uh, mobile. Um, so we believe strongly in the Sri Lankan consumer. We believe that Sri Lankan consumer deserves nothing but the best. Uh, we don't believe that Sri Lankan consumer is ready to take anything substandard or uh, something outdated. Um, and then that's the main ethos of and is based on delivering the future today. Um, so we have trial 5G in about 80 sites. No sooner government is willing to give commercial licenses, we will expand 5G. Because again, Sri Lankan consumer believes nothing but the best. And in terms of um, 5G runs on non-standalone, which basically connects to the existing 4G network uh, and expand. We have also trial 5G standalone network, which is a separate layer of 5G. Um, and we just completed 
5G millimeter wave, which is on the 27 uh, gigahertz band, which goes up to 4, MB, uh, 4 Gbps for industrial applications. Um, so the technology is available, um, and we are keen to make it available to our um, Sri Lankan consumers and enterprises because I think if we are to get out of this challenge, we have to adopt technology. We have to embrace and we have to be bold in adopting technology. Um, the traditional solutions are important, but if you are to leapfrog, this is also an opportunity. We have to see the opportunity in this crisis. Uh, otherwise, we will be only seeing the doom and the gloom, uh, and we will go down the spiral. But how can we use the challenge to use technology so that we can come out of this crisis uh, together as a better nation. In terms of our own challenges, I think access to foreign exchange is one. Then generating sufficient returns on the investments, again, is a big challenge. Sri Lanka prices are maybe the 10th, uh, between the top 10 cheapest countries in the world, both for voice, broadband, but we are a very small market. So in that context, how do you generate sustainable returns? Over the last maybe 15 years, 25 years, we have invested, invested two and a half billion dollars on the network. Two and a half billion dollars on the network. But if you look at today, our market cap, it's 200 million dollars. So that means the shareholder is not looking at the investment that we have put in to expand. But that doesn't hold us back, being the first GSM network in South Asia, first. 3G network, first 4G as well as 5G, we would use the challenge to grow. When everyone sees uncertainty, we see clarity in that uncertainty, because through that we see opportunity to grow. And when everyone is taking a wait and see approach, we see how can we double down on our investments. This year we are investing 50 billion rupees, 50 billion Sri Lankan rupees. Last year we invested 34 billion. So we are nearly 50% more investment this year. We are not shying away from investments. We are putting solar into about 1,200 sites to give more reliability. Because power availability is one of the biggest challenges we have. We spoke about Gamata Sanvedinia. We have about 50 sites still running 24 hours on generator on Gamata Sanvedinia. We connected 100% railway on another government project, about 80 sites again running 24 hours on generator. And mind you, getting access to diesel, refueling all these sites. So again, solar is something that we are using in this challenge. How can we use solar to go green, improve reliability? Then we are putting lithium ion batteries. Again, site availability is very crucial. So across the entire network, we are converting into so, uh, lithium ion, which is about another $25 million investment. We are just completing that project to improve reliability reduce the power consumption, because our energy bill for a month is about 500 million. And imagine when it goes up by 40% with the tariffs in electricity. So we see how do we use the challenge to bring in better efficiencies, improve better experience to the customer by doing things differently, and making sure our services are available, our services are affordable and applicable to our customers. So it's very, very important not to bog get bogged down by the challenge. Use the challenge to see the opportunity and deliver better growth. Thank you, Sapun. And I think it's, it's timely, like, you know, the statement you made is uh, looking at the challenges and look, making it opportunity. Like, you know, there's definitely the lifeline um, what, what uh, we are looking at. In the same line, I will move to uh, Janaka. Um, so uh, uh, we spoke about the opportunities and like you know economic uh, turnaround. So one of the key uh, key uh, segments in our economy is the SMEs, uh, which is the we have seen a lot of spoken uh, talk about SMEs getting digitizing, going global, uh, going growing bigger, etc. Uh, from a Sri Lanka Telecom Mobile point of view, uh, what's the role you play? Uh, in uh, in this space, especially in the SME sector, and how you're looking at scaling them up and bringing up to the market, and what are the services you're offering to them? Uh, as you say, like, 
SME is, I think, a very vital sector in the economy. Uh, <coughs> so if you look at the recent, uh, like the pandemic situation, you can see like the experience that we had, like uh, say for SME, uh, to access to their supply chain would have been an issue. And again, to market their products, so how to get your product to the market. Uh, because physically people couldn't come and also like if you look at Sri Lanka it's a very small market and for SME if you are uh, like in an area maybe you are open to that particular area only so I think you had to uh, remove all these uh, location barriers so in that sense as telcos I'm not uh, only limiting to SLT but all the telcos wired and wireless providers I think uh, we can uh, help the SMEs to uh, bring uh, to, to, to take their products to the global market, uh, not only Sri Lanka, but to the global market through all these digital platforms. So they are, again, like uh, I think the cloud uh, platforms play a bigger role and uh, uh, having a good internet connectivity, uh, reliable, uh, secure uh, internet connectivity where you can give, uh, you, can, you can, I mean, uh, give an average like a throughput assured uh, for a SME, I think that would be a great help for SME, uh, the community. Uh, so some of the examples, I think, uh, when you do this, like uh, uh, when you go to the cloud, uh, now we talk about like uh, the meta, I mean metaverse, uh, right? So similarly, uh, I don't know whether how soon we can go there, but. Now, SLT, we have SLT Traverse where it's like a virtual tour and you have the virtual stores. Uh, so that kind of a place, uh, people can, uh, or the buyers can visit uh, these virtual stores. And uh, that is globally. So globally, you are connected uh, to this uh, marketplace. So that kind of uh, thing that com comes to my mind, like uh, you expand your market uh, through the digital platforms. And uh, also one other uh, pr service that we have given is like the cloud-based uh, POS, like the point of sale. So you don't have to have a point of sale uh, equipment, but uh, it's available in the cloud and uh, based on the like a cloud-based uh, application where the SMEs can use that uh, POS machine to do uh, their businesses. And uh, also, uh, <laughs> going uh, beyond the internet, the normal, the connectivity in Sri Lanka, I think the most latest technologies we have introduced like SD-WAN, software-defined WAN, uh, and also the volume-based internet. So uh, you pay uh, as you use. So you pay only for your usage. And uh, with the SD-WAN, you can have your, as I said earlier also, like the mission-critical uh, traffic going in one path, maybe it's like a fiber or a copper or a 4G connection, uh, but uh, you, you can get the uh, whatever the application in the cloud you can access through the internet. So you have a different internet line uh, coming to the SD WAN edge. And uh, going beyond, I think uh, we can talk about the SD LANs, local area networks, and also uh, some uh, services like SASE, the secure access uh, service edge where you get, like when you work from home, you get the same kind of experience that you are uh, in your office. So you get the same security uh, for your application <laughs> access uh, while you are in, uh, you are, while you are at home or while you are on the move or while you are in office. So there are again the reliable uh, internet access, I think is required and uh, Add to what uh, uh, the earlier speakers said about the 4G and 5G, I think uh, some of the applications, uh, it all depends on the application. It all depends on the need, right? Because it's a heavy investment for a telco uh, to go and invest on a 5G network countrywide. So countrywide, I don't think it will happen soon. Uh, but based on the like industrial activities, maybe some companies, they might need like the manufacturing, they might need like low latency applications or massive IoT type applications. So then, then again, there you can have your 5G pockets uh, while 4G is coexisting. So it will be like a common core you have for the 4G and 5G and serving uh, the nation. Thank you, Janaka. In meantime, there are a lot of questions coming. I'll ask a quick question from you. Uh, it is specifically addressed to you. The question is, when are you, when are you changing the copper lines? 
uh, especially this is mentioned in Kaduela area, um, probably can give a quick answer. I think the question is, uh, when are you uh, terminating or retiring the copper, copper network? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most of the countries, they have started retiring the copper network. We also had a plan, uh, but with the COVID uh, and the country macroeconomic situations, we are facing uh, some difficulties because of the, as even uh, earlier speakers said, we are heavily dependent on uh, foreign exchange. So all this equipment comes from overseas. We have to use our dollars. Uh, there we have a challenge uh, right now. Uh, so actually our plan earlier was to like uh, go for a 2 million, uh, to cover 2 million households with optical fiber. In Sri Lanka, I think there are about 5.8, 5.9 million households. Uh, so, uh, we have a plan right now because uh, even the ADSL services, I think, uh, these manufacturers, in time to come, they will stop manufacturing some of these devices. So, uh, it's not a choice, I think it has to be done. Uh, but right now, because of the challenges I mentioned, uh, we have delayed that plan. Yeah, well, we don't have a choice, right? It has to be changed. So moving into Ashish, Ashish you spoke up uh, in length about the experiences in India and uh, like you know and also other parts of the country. Uh, what's your game plan? I mean, with your experience going downstream uh, for Sri Lanka. Uh, so in, the, uh, in terms of uh, our game plan, our first focus is on experience, providing a best network experience to the customer in Sri Lanka. And in line of that, in the last two years, amidst COVID and the economic crisis, uh, Airtel has invested nearly $135 million uh, in Sri Lanka to upgrade our network. We have rolled out more than 2,400 uh, 4G sites in the last two years uh, among this crisis and, and economic condition to provide the best possible network uh, covering as of now about 90% population of Sri Lanka. Uh, I think in the past, uh, if I really look back, uh, in the past, uh, SLT Mobitel and I think uh, Dialog has done a great job in terms of creating a basic infrastructure of telecom in the country. Now, as the new kid on the block, uh, the latest entrant into the 4G, our focus is to provide a value-driven innovations, which is to enhance the experience of the customers by providing them simplistic services and at a very affordable price. And that's what we are currently focusing on. In the last one year, if you look at, uh, we were probably the first one in the last year to convert the smaller packs, which is seven day, 15 day, 20 day packs into saying, is there one pack which a customer can take for an entire month for all his needs? Then about four to five months back, we introduced first time in the country, uh, unlimited calling on all our packs so that it makes packs affordable, especially the middle and the lower end of the pyramid of the consumers. And we have also introduced uh, value-based innovation on the postpaid side, where we said none of your unused quota of data will ever be wasted. So whatever has been unused in one month, you can carry it into the next month and so on and so forth. So you'll never ever waste whatever is unused. So these are some of the examples of the value-based innovations that we had been doing on the, on the consumer side. Another thing that we are working very closely with different uh, part of the society is to create use cases of how can digital and telecom be of a use to society. One such recent case that we have worked out is with the National Institute of Mental Health, where we have along with them digitize the entire infrastructure of providing the mental health services to the citizens of Sri Lanka. So it's now available on the social media platform. Anybody can access rarely available mental health helplines across the country. And just to give you uh, the advantage of the use case, we have launched this service about a year back and we have already saved more than 100 lives using this helpline, taking an access to every part of the country. Our next focus area is going to be how can we connect the local businesses of Sri Lanka to the world. And to just to elaborate, Airtel has an access through its services to nearly 25% population of the world. We are covering as of now 2.1 billion addressable population across the world. Our endeavor is how can we make this population available as a market to the local businesses in Sri Lanka? How can Airtel be a bridge where the local startups, the local businesses can actually market their products in this 2.1 billion population spread across 18 countries of the world? So that's the agenda next 
that we are working on very closely. And hopefully, in some time, you will see the light of the day for this particular project for us. Yeah, thank you. With the time moving out, I'll move into quick questions. Some of the questions are mainly on the, the experiences. I think that is we covered, probably we'll skip that. And uh, next question is probably uh, uh, one more uh, thought can be add on is, uh, so I mean, possibly they have mentioned it in a way. I'll read it out. They are being so cash rich, request to update their telco towers with solar power. I think Supun touch upon this. Uh, anyone want to add a little bit on it? Uh, what's your game plan on uh, the solar energy and renewable energy? Yeah, only thing is that uh, that statement about being so cash rich uh, is a myth. <laughs> I think if you look at our uh, first half, we made a loss of 32 billion, 32 billion Sri Lankan rupees. Even our parent company made a loss because of Sri Lanka. So uh, I think the myth, the, it's, there's a big myth that telcos make huge sums of money, but if you look at the amount of money that you have to reinvest, um, it's a lot larger. Uh, so it's important to appreciate uh, uh -huh. the efforts that put in by the industry in terms of continuing investments, maintaining reliable services during this very, very challenging period of time, largely because of the support that we get from our parents. Uh, if not for the support that we are getting from the parents, uh, then this effort of continuing to invest uh, under these circumstances will be very, very challenging. Thank you. Thank you for support for that clarification. Thiru, you want to add? Uh, no, just to touch upon the, um, on the, on the solar. Yes, I think all the, um, all the telcos are very much interested uh, in deploying solar solutions, and I think we're all of us are actively looking, looking at, at, at what we can do to the maximum. Um, of course, the, the easy sites to convert immediately would be, uh, as Supun mentioned, there are sites that are running on 24-7 generators. So you can imagine those sites uh, you know, have to be converted to solar ASAP. Otherwise, we're spending a huge amount of uh, money on, on diesel fuel. Now, there are also other logistical issues that we have to think about that um, historically, a lot of our sites uh, would, were not designed for solar. So for solar panels, you need space. You, know, you need land area to deploy the panels. So uh, unfortunately, a number of sites would not have enough space uh, around the tower to deploy these solar panels, even though we may, may want to do it. So we have to look at these uh, logistical reasons and see how many of these sites can we convert to solar and how many are physically impossible uh, to do so. And uh, we'll, I think we'll continue uh, to see, uh, seek all avenues to exp uh, expand on that solar site. Thank you. Thank you, Tiro. Next question, I'll move. Uh, so I'll summarize the question also. But the first part is, is customers uh, having the freedom to choose the service provider is a basic right, but uh, current system where the numbers are owned by the network. So primarily, he's asking about the number portability. I think uh, Ashish touched upon about the MNP, right? Um, so I'll leave it to you uh, to answer that question. When uh, this, this was a buzzword we have spoken about um, like towards late of last year. Uh, where are we? Are we getting it? Uh, what's the game plan? So uh, I'll start and then maybe uh, these guys can add. Uh, so I think uh, the last year, uh, regulator has laid the framework, broad framework on the MNP implementation, or the full portability implementation, not only mobile number portability, but the uh, full portability, which includes the fixed services also. Now there's a consortium which has been formed. There's a company which has been formed, Lanka Portability which all the telcos are the member of that, and we have commenced our work on this. Uh, we are in the early stages of uh, doing the work in terms of launching the portability. But portability, all of us should understand, uh, is a big technical investment, which needs to happen in the country. Uh, currently, the country does not have a local uh, wherewithal house to Im implement the system here. Hence, the investment which needs to happen is in a few million dollars which has to be uh, put in and then the implementation itself takes about two to three quarters uh, of this so i don't see it happening in the near future with the next two to three quarters i don't see it happening but the work is uh, happening on this particular direction and hopefully next year we should be able to see the number of portability that's purely my view and i would any really thoughts ask. Yeah. The, from the number portability i think the started way back in 1999 UK and 2003 USA and uh, today the number portable requirement also may not be that if you are having a problem of the finding somebody 
you have so many social media to find it. But uh, still, I also feel we need the number portability. But it's not going to be just pluggable. And uh, like Lanka Clear, I'm sure China is very well aware. And the same way, like the, all the banks own the company, Lanka Clear, the similar way we set up, that's something uh, Ashish mentioned, similar way we set up number portability company, all the telcos are part of the director board, and the SLT group CEO is the chairman, and we had uh, three board meetings. The, now the setup is we had to create the company, recruit the team, and finalize the equipment, and bring down, connect it, and interconnect with other telcos to go live. And the today's dollar issue, and the challenges we face the telco, like Supun mentioned, even the dialogue to go minus, just imagine the others. And to remain in the industry and do it, whether it's going to be the priority, surely the customer point of view it should be the priority. But the real country point of view will have a little bit of question. Even though we run it, I don't think we can do it very fast. The reason is all the telcos are running, and it's not going to be a mobile number portability only, it's going to be a mobile and fixed line. And the requirement may be to priority mobile number portability. Fix can be a subsequently. But the internal, the, the company mandate is both to go live together. That also can create another problem. But in that sense, like uh, Ashish mentioned, easily 10 to 12 months game. But even though you get the feeling last year is going to be open next day, but it's not the reality. Being IT guys, Technical guys, I'm sure everybody will understand. The routing can't happen automatically. If you call the dialogue number which is on the somebody else's network, how do we route it? There are different ways in the, the routing mechanism. We select the path, we select the model, we select the way, we have the now blueprint, now the challenge is implementation. Surely if it is a normal scenario, implementation will not take time. The today's situation, I don't think anybody can exactly give you a time plan, look, before this date to go live. But we'll take time, but which is happening. That's the good news and the bad news. Thank you. So, answer was given, we have good news and other, other one, I'll call it a mixed news, right? Uh, so, uh, since we have almost come to the end of the time, quick question about, uh, I think, uh, Thiru also touched upon about the security part. Uh, so, and also one of the things is like, you know, a lot of school kids who are going in for the internet, like, you know, using online learning, etc. And also a lot of working from home, corporate security is important. Uh, uh, what a, on a summary, uh, on a quick answer, like, you know, on the security aspects, uh, what are your thoughts and what you are looking at and how you're strengthening it from your side, from a telecom point of view? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of the top priorities for all of us. Um, and it's, it's one of the biggest challenges that we are faced with. Um, and it's continuously evolving challenge. Um, and, and it's much easier to um, find uh, threats or those who want to attack. But managing the larger ecosystem of a telco um, and making sure everything remains secure um, is, is one of the biggest uh, tasks that we have. Lots of investment. Uh, go into this uh, space uh, in every layer, both in telco as well as in IT. Um, and it, it's a continuous challenge. We, we, we have a larger challenge, not only because of the larger ecosystem, but also multiple stakeholders that connect to our networks. Um, so it's a balance between making that connecting from outside uh, the network through APIs or whatever, uh, making it flexible and easy, easy but also uh, how do you make sure that those um, connections don't leave room uh, for both partners as well as um, even contractors, um, internal staff uh, that create vulnerabilities um, into the network? Um, so it's it's a larger challenge at, at Dialogue. We are working with the entire ASIATA group, and uh, the entire SOC for ASIATA group is based out of Sri Lanka, uh, looking after threats uh, in the entire country. Uh, the region, um, and it's something that even the entire country needs to take very seriously. Um, in, in, I think we have seen some challenges in certain areas, but um, as we embrace internet, as we embrace digital, uh, we need to also place similar emphasis on security. 
Um, otherwise, you are going and putting everything on the internet and into digital. But if you don't secure and if you don't, don't continuously update and don't have the discipline, uh, then uh, you are creating a lot of vulnerabilities uh, which would be very hard to um, recover. Just but to add uh, what Supun said, uh, I think one big thing where the biggest threat is also the consumer education. Because our experience in the world is that maximum of the security breaches happen because of phishing, which is nothing to do with the security systems that anybody can build up in the network, which is to do with the consumer education. Uh, so in addition to what uh, Supun said, which is all the, all the companies are investing a lot in terms of securing their data networks, the customer identities, and, and customer data. But I think a lot of consumer app, uh, education also needs to happen uh, to make people aware what kind of information to share and hence not fall for the phishing uh, which happens in the market. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I think we'll, we are, we are come to the end. We are taking a little bit longer than the, uh, uh, the planned time. Uh, so would like to thank all the panelists uh, taking their valuable time being here spending um, this uh, one hour or so to talk about and what their game plan and also educate the public. And most of the questions I tried to blend it and some of the questions were answered as well. So one thing is very clear. Uh, so we're looking at the theme, what uh, the Internet is all about. We are talking about the digital, uh, uh, digital lifestyle. And obviously the answers you got from them, uh, it's very clear that uh, we have a lifeline. And it's, it's not an easy path. Uh, Supun categorically said, like, uh, okay, there are challenges. Uh, it's not that uh, they make a lot of money. But uh, with the help of their parent companies, obviously, they keep investing and they continue to give the best service of the nation. And also specifically spoken about the experience and what the best, like, you know, not, not, not mediocre, like, you know, best services they are looking at giving it to you as end customers. With that note, uh, thanking all of them again, I would like to thank the organizers uh, putting this uh, uh, very exciting panel together and hope you learn something uh, within this one hour or so. Looking forward for the rest of the evening for the next sessions. Thank you very much.